Hi guys, we are here with Peter Cooper. Hi Peter. John to New York, it's your last work published in Italy. Uh, how it born? Uh, it's 40 years of living in New York and then all the comics I did over that time, the, the sketchbook drawing, the dreams I had, uh, some of the nightmares. Um, it's, it's a little bit of everything, some illustration work, painting, everything that, that was contained in the work I was doing in that time period. You've published uh, diaries from New York, uh, Mexico, Africa and Asia. Since you have been here in Italy sometimes now, uh, can we expect a diary from Italy in the, in the future? Well, I would like to actually want to do a, a collection of travel stories, and Italy would be part of that. So, because I've been drawing in my sketchbook here uh, in the many times I've been, and uh, so yeah, that would be part of it too. Your drawing style in ruins is uh, very different from your past works. Uh, with such a long career, your style is, is still in evolution. For me, it's, it's a necessity. Some of it is boredom. Some of it is, uh, if I work in one style for too long, it starts to become a style and I want it to be more natural than that. So uh, when I was living in Mexico, I was doing a lot of drawing in my sketchbook, and that was the primary outlet. And that was different from my stencil and spray paint work, which is much more controlled and something I would do in a studio. I was drawing on the street and a more it was a more active, um, freer approach. And I wanted to bring that quality into the work that I did about Mexico, but also I just got tired of stencil and spray paint. Also, it's incredibly poisonous, so I, I just I didn't want to die for my style. And that's always a difficulty because um, it's kind of a lost period, like I'm not absolutely certain what my voice is. And it's curious because it, it kind of started to make sense as a more cartooning, which I, I ended up getting work in The New Yorker, yeah. and that style worked really perfectly for the current ideas I have about Donald Trump and all the things that I want to talk about. I'm, it's got a little bit of humor in it, so it's not completely desperate and sad. And that's appropriate for the type of mentality that I'm in right now. You work for the cult magazine Mad with the series Spy vs. Spy. Would you tell us uh, some uh, stories or curiosity about working on this legendary magazine? Well, I grew up reading Mad, and it's it's part of my DNA at this point. I, I, it helped me understand the possibility of politics and humor meeting somewhere. And Antonio Progias, who created Spy vs. Spy in 1961, introduced me to the idea of wordless comics, which have been a very big, important part of what I do. Many pieces of Mad were, were already part of the kind of work I, want, I wanted to do, and this uh, small miracle, it's very small, uh, where they asked me if I wanted to try out for Spy vs. Spy, I almost said no right up at that moment because I was doing my own thing and I, I was doing stencils and spray paint. So I was like, well, okay, I'll do it in stencils and spray paint. They'll look at it, they'll hate it, and I'll yeah. go home. And the funny part is because I wasn't trying to get the job, I got the job. And I thought, well, okay, I'll do it for a year or two, and then it'll become, you know, sort of old. And I'm on my 22nd year of doing it, and it's uh, it's a really good way to reach a, uh, a different kind of audience, and it's fulfilling a an associative dream of being part of the usual gang of idiots, as they call the members of Mad. So there's there's so many aspects to it that I that I like. What I say is that Spy vs. Spy for younger readers who are reading it, who are looking at it, it's the gateway drug to my other work. Yeah. So they, they see that and they're like, oh, you do something else. Oh, yeah. And as they get older, they can look at my, uh, you know, drug, sex, rock and roll comics. You also adapted uh, into comics some Kafka's books. Uh, there are some other books you would like to adapt into comics. Well, I'm, I'm, I've become Mr. Adapter right now. So I just finished a 14 uh, Kafka short stories, and that's going to be my next book. Um, and then I'm, I turned to doing Heart of Darkness as an adaptation, Joseph Conrad's classic 
Yeah. And that's a 140 page book. And that's going to keep me busy until the end of the year. And then the book after, that I'd like to do after that would end up being a travel book. So I just have to see if I can find a publisher that wants me to, will, will let me do that kind of work, which I think would be a lot of fun. Yeah. How the comic industry has changed from the beginning of your career? It's better now or was better then? Oh, it's, it's way better now. Yeah. I mean, I almost was a hobby before, not on my end in terms of my mentality about it, but I, I couldn't get paid to do comics for the first 15 years of my career. It's a pretty long time to go of, or more like 10. But I just, there just started to be the kind of comics I wanted to do and what mainstream, bigger publishing was doing didn't line up at all. And so there were, there were really no major publishers who would pay money for that. So was, I worked with smaller publishers, which was you know, fine, but just financially difficult. So it meant that I was also doing illustration. I was, you know, I had to do a juggle in order to do, have art as a career. But comics were always primary in what I did, even if I was self-publishing, like with Magazine World War III, which uh, I, I started, I co-founded because I was doing comics and couldn't even find a publisher, even who wouldn't, not even for pay, just to get them published because they were politically inclined and this was at a point where the underground comics of the 60s and 70s were dead and so you know it was a really difficult time to do that but this is where I think you know pursuing your love is recommended because at the, at the end of the day the worst case is that you've done something you love as it turned out comics was a brilliant choice because now for example I, I got a two book deal with a major publisher to do my, my latest books and I can live on that and and just work on that if I chose to. I don't choose to because I want to do yeah, yeah. So day to day political commentary but I can you know like I moved to Mexico for four months just to work on Heart of Darkness so I would get the temperature and the smells and I got stung by a wasp when I was down there and there's scorpions and get the you know the vibe and the real experience, the real experience. and then, you know I'm, I'm not sure I could have afforded to do that earlier I think that you know I was going to do that kind of work no matter what I think if, if, I, if I still wasn't being paid I would still be doing comics but uh, it's it gets more complicated when you have uh, a child and, and your daughter's in college and university costs a ridiculous amount in the United States. So all that, you know, re real world things. And I don't really have another plan besides doing art. So I must do comics and, and draw. And get paid for it. And I have, to, I have to find out how to get paid for that. And that's just, you know, that's another creative, uh, that's a job also is, is to creatively do what you want and find a way. Uh, Rovina, I, I started working on that before I even had a publisher. I just it was like, I must do this. And it was a complete, like a, it felt like a suicide mission almost because I knew it was going to take years to do. And, uh, you know, but it, it had to be done. So, and when I've done work that, I, that matters to me, it's led to other work that maybe, you know, I don't get paid for this one here, but I get paid for that one there. World War III has never made any money whatsoever. But because I did World War III, then I might get invited to give a talk somewhere or teach somewhere like Harvard, yeah. which I, where I teach, and, and uh, School of Visual Arts in New York. And that's in part because of the experiences that I have that are maybe coming from places that, you know, aren't financially, you know, as, as reasonable. About uh, World War III, the magazine you co-founded, uh, tell us the reason behind the, the creation of this magazine. Um, when I was in art school, Ronald Reagan was running for president, and the idea that this shitty actor was going to be the president, actually that could happen. He had been a joke very much like Donald Trump, in fact. Uh, my friend and I were doing comics. We couldn't find an outlet for them. We saw art around New York that was being done that was brilliant that we wanted to also make sure didn't disappear. That was commentary. And we had done a fanzine before that, growing up, 
in Cleveland. I did, uh, we probably started when I was about 11. Mm -hmm. And we would interview cartoonists, do exactly this. Yeah. And then, you know, before I could draw, but I was really interested in comics. So the idea of self-publishing wasn't out of our understanding. And distribution, very difficult. And we sold them at the table at our, at our art school and then walked around and sold them to stores. And it was much more complicated, but slowly we kept going. But we're, we're in our coming up on our 40th year of publication, and that goes against all common sense, which, in and of itself, is a success. To not to not get buried by uh, the lack of money, the lack of uh, you know the difficulty in doing something like that. How do you get into comics uh, at first, and which comic artist influenced you the most as a kid? Um, I started reading Marvel, um, so it was Thor, Jack Kirby, Jack Kirby just, you know, sent me to the moon, and uh, Stan Lee writing. Um, I was, I started reading sort of whatever, I read, I read a fair amount of uh, Richie Rich and uh, Little Dot and all the Harvey comics, I like those too. Um, I, you know, it was big expansion to read Batman. And then um, when I was about, when I was 11, I got to go to my first comic convention, yeah. amazingly. And it was really early in, in comic fandom. And so you'd meet the artists and all. And it was the most exciting thing in the world. And I started seeing underground comics even then, when I was, before I was an age I could buy them. And then there were some very, uh, very kind hippies in my local town who were willing to sneak copies and sell me underground comics. And, you know, when I started getting stoned and wanting to have sex, then underground comics made much more sense than superheroes. And I still sort of was like a little bit of both, but then there was a point where underground comics and the kind of stories that Robert Crumb and, you know, fabulous furry freak brothers, Gilbert Shelton, and Richard Corbin, and... Uh, uh, Greg Irons and lots and lots of Zap and all the yeah. Zap artists, Spain, Rodriguez, all that work just was really appealing to me. And um, and I always was reading Mad, which is associated with the underground comics also. Um, so it's like, you know, sort of a mashup of things. But I, you know, I'm really interested in cartoon art in general. So I looked at New Yorker cartoons growing up a lot. Uh, and I looked at animation, of course. And the uh, comic conventions early on were an opportunity to not only meet the creators, but then be exposed to science fiction, fantasy. Uh, they would show movies all night, and so I would see early Superman, the Fleischer Brother cartoons, uh, Night of the Living Dead, yeah, and King Kong. And so I got a really great education in, uh, in all these different forms. But... You know, to go back to your earlier question about it, are things better now? Comics were not considered even to be an art. It was a low art. It wasn't even considered to really be an art form. Well, now they're in museums, naturally, and nobody questions the value of them as an art form. Well, not nobody, but yeah, yeah. It's you know, if you if you don't know they're an art form, that just means you don't know. So that change is dramatic. And on the other hand. I never doubted the form, I, and it made me maybe almost angrier and more like it was almost more of a crusade to yeah, tell yeah. people this is one of the this is the greatest art form out there. This is a combination of words and pictures. To say that that's not art is just you know blew my mind. It was a pretty easy fight on my end, but that didn't change anything, and I benefited from that that changed so much because, for example, I mean, I, I taught the first class at Harvard in comics, in graphic novels. Uh, I've been invited to festivals, literary festivals around the world where I'm the comic guest. The first time they've ever looked at graphic novels as a literary form. Do you think that digital comics will replace uh, traditional ones in the future? I hope not. I think that there's there's sort of different forms. Uh, the the experience, uh, you know, I mean, if we all have big enough screens so that you're looking at two pages and can turn back a page and, and check the way comics are supposed to be read, the way I do them at least, is you're supposed to have 
two pages. Totally and, agree. And, and be able to have your eye move around. And my job involves that process of directing you to look where I want you to look and have the experience of turning the page for the surprise, not turning a panel. So they're very different creatures. You also like manga and oriental comics uh, in general. In general, no. There's, there's certainly uh, there's something, you know, Tedziga's work. That, that there's, there's brilliant work in any of these forums. Uh, uh, is it Tetsumi? Um, yeah, it's your Tetsumi. Uh, is more, you know, the underground version of of that, which has more personality. Um, the the uh, it's a uh, it's a Gaikaka, I think. Gaikaka. Yeah, for example, that's of interest to me, but the blanket style that happens, I have the same reaction to superhero comics. In your travels here, do you discover some Italian artists that you like? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, GP, of course, is fantastic. And, um, uh, well, actually, you know, I mean, here at, at the festival, there's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing more work that I like than not. I would probably have trouble giving you a lot of the names because many of them are new to me. They have seen so much great work here. Uh, Igor, fantastic. Also, uh, a lot of the work that uh, is at Bao, Publishes, uh, for ex yeah, for example, uh, I'm trying to think of this. Is it Francisco? Um, there's a guy, watercolor artist, that's absolutely brilliant. Not uh, yeah, I think that's that's right. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, overwhelming amount of quality work that's being done, and that's also true with American and other European, French, Spanish uh, cartoonists. It used to be very easy to keep up because it was so limited, but now. The quantity of fantastic work is really, um, really impressive. This was Peter Cooper. Really, thank you, Peter. My pleasure. And see you next time.